Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Matthias Newman Brossig from the University of Hamburg, who will be talking about on the homology of hyperbolic groups. Thank you. Actually, it's, uh, I'm from the University of Braunschweig. Oh, sorry. Or we just called Brunswick in uh, English, I think. And uh, Mr. Rosenberg is from, oh, sorry. from, really from Hamburg. Okay, uh, so. Okay, I'm going to talk on the, about the homology of, of hyperbolic groups. Um, as homology theory and, of course, uh, all of homological algebra is a bit involved in most cases, uh, I just thought it would be better to be on the safe side and uh, define the homology of the group first. So uh, I don't want to bore you. Who of you doesn't know the definition? I'd yeah. like a reminder. Okay, it so will be nice, yeah. yeah. I'm going to give you a reminder. So um, what you do when you want to calculate group homology um, is you choose a perfect, uh, projective resolution. Um, I'm going to come, come to the term projective right now. And you apply this functor, z times z gamma, which gamma is called uh, the name of the group. And um, what does this functor do actually? It's just taking co invariance. So you see, if you've got a group, in, uh, group element uh, on the right side, you can take it over there. You consider z as a trivial uh, z gamma module. and so it just divides out the group action, basically. Geometrically, uh, geometrically that's just the same as taking, taking some kind of contractible complex on which the group acts freely. You take the, um, the chain complex from that, just like in uh, topology, and you just divide out the group action in that complex. That's what happen what's happening geometrically. So. Um, and that's ex uh, exactly what's going to happen in my talk later on too. So it's nice to have that. And then if you, uh, you get, well, you start with this re uh, resolution, which is just some kind of infinite sequence of modules, basically. So PM plus one, and we got DM plus one DM. And as it's a re resolution, we have image of dn plus 1 is equal to kernel of dn. Can you read that? <laughs> yeah, we can. Different yeah. Marker. Maybe I should, should use a different marker there. So that's by the definition of the resolution. So that just means the homology groups are all trivial, and all the modules are projective. Now, when we apply this functor, uh, functor what uh, happens is that uh, this exactness in the sequence, the resolution is basically an exact, uh, exact sequence, right? The exactness is destroyed most of the time, except in the case of free groups. And uh, what we get is a chain complex that is, at first, it's, it's not a ZG module anymore, as you can see, that there goes to uh, abelian groups or set modules. And uh, what we get is a chain complex that is not a resolution. Okay, we could use another functor here, but then we would uh, have a different geometric interpretation, and what we really want is that geometric interpretation I mentioned earlier. That's uh, the reason why we take co-invariance here. <coughs> and so what we, uh, what we do now is uh, we get this chain complex, which looks exactly the same, Cn, Cn minus 1, Cn minus 2, and we compute homology, which is just, let me see, Kernel of dn minus one, dn minus one, modular the image of dn. Hello. That's not a problem at all. And this uh, we said to be the homology of the group. Okay. So there are two things that need mentioning. The first I already said. Set is considered a set gamma model with trivial action. We can take any abelian group here. And in fact, there are homology theories with other modules here. But uh, I'm just going to concentrate on integer hom homo group homology. And uh, if the resolution is not projective, uh, we don't get a well-defined factor here. So we really need that one. Um, let me actually remind you of the definition of the word projective in any category. So uh, if I've got a module P and two modules M and M, um, whatever, what's this, uh, this sign called in English? 
prime. M prime. Yes. And epimorphism, E here. P is protective if for any phi, if for any homomorphism here, and any epimorphism here, we get some kind of some uh, module homomorphism here, such as uh, that this kind of can use. This doesn't need to be unique, but it's, uh, we just need to have existence for that one. Can I ask a, a basic question? Yes. It's something that always gets to me. So homology is computed for what reasons? Is it some type of invariant of the group, or it studies levels of abelian? It's an invariant of the group. It's, it's an invariant. That's, that's in, it's an invariant, but that's not the only reason, because right. homology actually gives um, a few geometric properties of, uh, of, of the group. Of the group. So, I'll come to that later because uh, some of them are very interesting in the, in the light of finiteness conditions, which is what I'm actually going to mm -hmm. talk about. Okay. But uh, yeah, the first and most important thing is it's a group. It's a group invariant. Mm -hmm. That's the same as saying we got a functor here, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier to have uh, abelian groups as an invariant than, work, uh, than to work with a with a group directly. So you take a group which is not necessarily abelian, yes. the homology groups will be abelian? Yes. And then you could look at those, I see, okay. That's true. Okay. You see, um, choosing a resolution which is um, P, which is uh, just a chain of uh, Z gamma modules here, where yeah, gamma is the group. Uh, I'm sorry that I take gamma as the name of the group, but I come from the background of uh, Fuchsian groups, and we mm -hmm. always call them gamma there. Yep. I think yeah. Is there a classification of free groups in terms of homology? I mean, okay. what, is, what is the story of homology? I think it's 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 more or less the same. I mean, uh, you have you have uh, for of course you have uh, the zero homology of the integers is uh, that itself, and H um, one is always of any group is always uh, the abelianization of of the group and. Mm -hmm. Uh, all other group, uh, all other modul modules, or all other abelian groups, well, abelian groups are set modules, so it's basically the same thing. All others are trivial for mm -hmm. free groups. Yeah. I can uh, maybe I can give you an example later on for the algorithm we uh, implemented okay. for for the for this group here. That I think every other group is going to be kind of difficult for now. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and what does uh, projective actually mean? I mean, this is the definition, but what it really boils down to is you've got a direct summand of some uh, free module. I mean, P is projective. It's, there's some space over there. I'm sorry, I I don't have much whiteboard space, so I've got to use all of it. Right on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> P is projective if there's some Q such that the direct uh, equivalent to the definition for modules. I think there's some similar result for any abelian category, but uh, that doesn't concern us right now. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, it's not a problem. So, <laughs> are there questions uh, until now, other than? Okay. Thank you. So, the first uh, thing you ask, so it's a good question, why homology? The next question we can ask is, why hyperbolic groups? <laughs> Okay, and for that we, shall, we should define what a hyperbolic group actually is. So uh, in my case, a hyperbolic group is just um, it's just a group where the Cayley graph is hyperbolic as a metric space. So we take edges, we give them length one, and if this metric space is hyperbolic, we call the group hyperbolic. Okay, this uh, we need to check if this is well defined. It turns out if we take a symmetric finite generating set then uh, we get a well-defined definition here. By symmetric, I mean uh, one is not in the, in the generating set, and I mean for every, every element, S in our generating set, we also have S inverse is in the, the generating set. That just means that our edges are not directed in the Cayley graph. Okay. Um, but I will, I will need the notion of delta hyperbolic, so uh, don't try to read this map right now. I'm going to write, I'm going to draw a picture, which is much easier. So um, a group is hyperbolic if it is delta hyperbolic for some delta. And what does that mean? So 
you give me, uh, there exists a delta, delta, such that you give me any three elements of my group, which I consider as a metric space. So I think I call them x, y, z here. That's good. x, y, z. And any geometric, uh, geodesic path from one to the other. So there could be more than one. I mean, if you're not in free group, it could happen that there's more than one. Uh, this, this has to work for any one of these. And you take any x0 on one of these arcs, which are geodesic. So uh, it doesn't matter which one, because I said for every x, y, z. So I can just take it on this arc. And uh, the group is delta hyperbolic if the distance of this x0 to, any, uh, to the union of these other two arcs is less than or equal to delta. This is just what we got here. And if this holds for any, for any combination of x, y, z and any geodesic paths, then we got a delta hyperbolic group. Okay, and then it turns out that this delta does depend on the choice of s, but obviously if we uh, make s larger, delta can get smaller. But uh, they, if, if gamma s is delta hyperbolic for some delta, gamma s prime would be delta hyperbolic for another one too. So this is well defined, but it depends on the choice of s, which is very important for any kind of algorithm to try to implement. Uh, okay, so that's the definition. It's um, why do we study these groups? Okay, at first, uh, that's easy to see. All finite groups are hyperbolic because we can just take delta to be the diameter of uh, the Cayley graph. So that's easy, and, and that's a nice thing because the rule theory works for finite groups. Um, all uh, Fuchsian groups, Fuchsian? Um, Fuchsian, yes. Fuchsian groups yes. or Kleinian groups of finite co-volume are hyperbolic too. Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a deep theorem, but um, it turns out to be that way because you can construct a, construct a metric on the Cayley graph. Uh, okay, you've got a metric on the Cayley graph that is quasi isomorphic to the hyperbolic metric you get for the uh, for the hyperbolic structure. So, and of course. Um, Fundamental groups of closed hyperbolic surfaces are uh, hyperbolic, but that's not different uh, different from uh, from the from saying that Fuchsian groups are, but for the closed ones that is. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, so there's an abundance of hyperbolic groups, and um, actually we don't have a kind we don't have an algorithm to check whether a group is hyperbolic. It would be nice to have that. We don't. We just know many many examples. At least they're finitely presented. Yeah, yeah. it turns Hyperbolic out that groups. all of them are finitely presented. So if, you, if S is <laughs> symmetric and finite, uh, it's always enough to um, take finitely many relations, mm -hmm. and you can you have gamma. But um, yeah, they have other useful properties too. So it's equivalent to having a Dean algorithm. Dean, Dean, Dan. Dan. A Dan algorithm. A Dan, yeah. uh, Dan algorithm. The linear isometric function. Uh, so. so we can solve the word problem efficiently yeah. in these groups, and that's a nice feature, I think. That's why we wanted to study these. Actually, why we wanted to study these is uh, going to be uh, two slides uh, two slides away. But uh, yeah, questions so far? I think I'm much too going much too fast. Whatever. Oh, sure. So uh, I need the Ribs complex. Uh -huh. The Ribs complex, uh, again, this delta doesn't have anything to do with delta hyperbolic. It just happens to be um, to be the same letter historically. That's why I'm using it too. That's kind of bad for this talk, really. OK. Um, the Ribs complex is, is an abstract simpl simplicial complex. As uh, simply says, we just take subsets of groups, group elements. This is here. We take subsets of group elements. We don't want to have the same element twice in, in one, uh, one simplex. And what we do want is that if, if two elements are in a simplex, two group elements, mm -hmm. then their distance in the k graph should be at most this delta. OK. Taking all these sets gives us an abstract simplicial complex. And uh, that this complex has some nice properties. Um, I think I could give an easy example of the Ribs complex, which is, which is kind of nice. I'm going to take the integers, and I'm going to take 
delta equal to 2. So if this is 0, and I'm going to put the even numbers down up here, and the odd numbers down there, minus 1. OK, so let's at first take the edges of our, of our complex. Uh, if we take one cell, there's another marker. There's a marker. There's two. Ah, uh, okay. Try <laughs> more. So one cell should be should be cells of two elements that are at most uh, have at most distance two. So that's just yeah, that's good. like this. So note that this is actually the Cayley uh, graph of Z with uh, the generic rating set plus minus one, and we get z these edges too, and as two two cells. We got uh, we get these triangles here, so that's an example of Ripps complexes. Not really that amazing, but still. And note that uh, this complex is uh, contractible. This is going to be very important later. Mm -hmm. uh, are there questions? So, yeah, that's what I just told you. It's, it, uh, it's not by accident that this complex is uh, contractible, but if we have a hyperbolic group and take n large enough, then the Ribs complex gets contractible. And I think uh, some of you may can actually can guess now where this is going to lead. I mean, we've got a contractible complex on which the group acts, and um, this is going to be some kind of um, einberg maglein argument there. Mm -hmm. So we have not have, have any hyperbolic group. The Ribs complex is contractible. That's good. And there are a few other properties we need for our for my proof. The Ribs complex uh, is actually locally finite. That's just because we took uh, took our generating set to be finite, and uh, we got an induced action of gamma on the Ribs complex. But um, that's just uh, if we got x zero xn and have a group element g, then it just acts by left multiplication. Note, remember that these xn's were uh, group elements, so nothing strange here. But uh, there's a nice property. Okay, the induced, induced action is faithful. Well, it's got to be because uh, the zero cells are just the points of the elements of the group, and of course we've got a faith, faithful action there. The most important thing is the stabilizer of every simplex is finite. Again, these are just group elements, so there's just, there's just finitely many uh, elements that take x0 to one, one of the others. So you can see that directly. And that's why uh, torsion free hyperbolic groups are nice. Because uh, if, if, uh, if every stabilizer is finite and our group is torsion free, then every stabilizer must, add, uh, must, be, must be trivial. And that's exactly the reason why we're going to give an algorithm just for torsion free groups later on. Hmm. Okay, and uh, well, the quotient, the quotient space is compact, that uh, this quotient space is going to be the Allenbeck Glenn space in our talk, in my talk later on. Um, shall I give another defin a, a definition of the Allenbeck Glenn space, or is, is that clear? Uh, I'll need it. Okay, so I'll give you one. Because I'm gonna, gonna use it in the proof, which I'm going to outline. So let let G be a group. The space, topological space. X is called. Uh, let's call these and like my blank spaces car. KG1 space if space if okay at first we want to take we want to have um, that the fundamental group uh, I think you can't read this either can you? Can you try getting more? Yeah. Okay. Basically, we just want to want to have the that the homology of the space is the homology of our group. That's, okay. that's the idea. Um, okay. But I can write the formal, um, the formal definition, it's not a problem. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Go on. 
Okay. Um, so the fundamental group of our space is supposed to be G. And uh, if Y is the universal covering of this, uh, this space X, then we have that H I Y is trivial for all Y greater than 1. Well, I could take greater or equal because I'm talking about the universal covering there. It doesn't make a difference. Okay, and that's it. And it turns out that these spaces um, are just the geometric interpretation of my definition of group, of the definition of group homology. Hello. Oh, sorry. Sorry. It's not a problem. You didn't miss anything. You know that from Vegas. Okay, good. As long as I didn't miss the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so that's the definition of group homology. There wasn't one, actually. <laughs> so, and uh, what we did now is we said, okay, we've got this ribs complex, which is contractible if we, uh, if we take, a, take a hyperbolic group and take n to be large enough. And we've got the group operation. Uh, we know that this group operation is free, or at least the stabilizers are very small. And what can we say about the homology of our group? And it turns out that we can, in the torsion free case, we can actually calculate a, f a free resolution of our group. Not only that, but um, as you see here, in the torsion free case, so these u's are all trivial. We've got a free resolution p of z over z gamma, which we need. Uh, we, we wanted a projective one. We actually even get a free one, uh, such that all modules are finitely generated. And if it's torsion free, uh, the resolution is of finite length too. So this is actually some, something we can uh, calculate in a computer because free modules are just matrices mm -hmm. of, uh, over all the group rings. And if we're not in the torsion free case, things get more difficult because the stabilizers aren't finite. And uh, so as we are torsion free, as we are not torsion free, there can't be a finite uh, resolution of finite length. But we still get a resolution that has the property that all modules are finitely generated, which still is a nice idea because that allows us to plug these modules, this resolution, into a computer and calculate group homology by means of linear algebra. Mm -hmm. so, Although, you know, a torsion, for example, one related groups are also hyperbolic. So um, I said torsion, one related groups are also hyperbolic. Yeah. Right. So your program does not apply to that. It, it does because we can we can still uh, calculate this resolution. It only it has finite uh, infinite length. But if you're interested in say the fifth homology group, you could apply that. Oh, I see. Um, but as you'll see in the proof, torsion makes everything much more difficult in this case. Okay. So for those of you who know a bit more about homological finiteness conditions, I can summarize the theorem like this, which is I think it's it's much shorter. If gamma is hyperbolic, then gamma is of the hyperbolic type Fp infinity. And if it's also torsion free, then gamma is of type Fl. Okay. Note also that I, uh, I need free resolutions for finite subgroups of set of set gamma for finite subgroups. Where, uh, well, we say for every finite subgroup, that's not true, that's a lie. We don't need it for all, but we need it for some. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, these are the stabilizers of of the cells in the ribs complex. So let me give you an outline of the proof. I'm sorry for those who were in Vegas, you know most of this. Uh, oh, we could bear to hear it twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first step is not very, you know, very exciting. We just take uh, n large enough so the ribs complex is contractible. Then we construct the ribs complex. Um, doing that, uh, well, it, it sounds kind of complicated, but uh, what you really do is you take your you take your generating set, apply it to itself for n times, and uh, check for uh, check which simplices you need for the ribs complex. So you can actually do it in a computer because of the action of the group. You can reduce uh, most of the calculations. We uh, implemented that for three groups and for a few of the uh, of the finite groups. So is your software available online, perhaps? Uh, no, I just did it for my diploma thesis. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So 
we construct the ribs complex. And as I already said, uh, the ribs complex is contractible. That, of course, means the cellular chain complex means it's a cyclic or contractible or whatever you want to call it. So all the homology groups of this chain complex are trivial. And we've got a, an operation of the group on the chain complex. Okay, so if gamma is torsion free, we're actually done because we've got a resolution and if gamma is torsion free, we know that the operation must be free mm -hmm. because uh, if it wasn't, every stabilizer must at least be finite and we don't have finite subgroups. So that just means uh, that our operation on the, on the ribs complex is free and vice versa, the operation on our cellular chain complex is free too. Okay, so that was the proof for the, uh, the um, torsion free case and in fact this is the universal cover of the ironback maclean space I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So the ironback maclean space would be the, uh, the ribs complex modular, modular the group action. Okay, so now we come to the hard part. I don't know how much I'm going to go into the proof for that one because uh, you know, this one takes five lines or so if, you, if you've got it all set up. And this one like, was like, I think, three or four pages in the diploma <laughs> thesis. So it's a bit more difficult. Uh, but okay, let's see. So if gamma is not torsion free, the resolution can't be free. Otherwise, we would have, uh, would have proved that uh, gamma would be torsion free too. That's another thing you can do with homology groups. If, uh, if, if there's an integer such that all homology groups uh, hi with i greater than that integer are trivial. Uh, aren't uh, trivial? Let me let me write it down. It's, it's easy. So if you uh, if you've got an integer such that uh, that h i h j of gamma uh, I'm sorry of gamma is not equal to zero. So so that's what I mean for some for J uh, greater or equal to than I. That means, uh, okay, what I really want to have is we have uh, homology groups as far as we go, non trivial ones. Then it follows. Actually, it's the other way around. So <laughs> if gamma is not torsion free, <coughs> I'm sorry. If gamma is not torsion free, we get homology groups. Uh, as far as we as we want for every i that is. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Isn't it usually difficult to calculate these homology groups though? Yeah, that's I mean already the second homology group is is yeah. uh, is it the second one am I thinking about? The I remember I remember trying to do these one time. It wasn't a trivial thing. I mean the first one is easy, it's <laughs> billionization. <laughs> yeah. After that you're already in trouble. Yeah, that's true, but that's just because uh, that's uh, just the reason we do this. We want to ca calculate homology groups computationally, or okay. at least we want to have a setting in which we say, okay, we know how to do it computationally, which is some something different because the ribs complex gets very big. I'll come to that in, in the end. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's very very hard to calculate these. But if you if you are not torsion free, you get homology groups as high as you want to go. Have, have, to what uh, level have you calculated homology groups for some, <laughs> you know, for example, for some non-trivial hyperbolic group? I <laughs> um, it, you mean with its with theory. your program? With, uh, your with my program? No, I, uh, as I did it only for my uh, oh, so it's thesis, a theoretical. It, it's yeah. more like a theoretical result. We, you could implement it. Right. Uh, it wouldn't be a problem, but um, the, pro the storage space would be would have to be very very big indeed. Oh, I see. So, I mean, um, hyperbolic groups are kind of similar to free groups in many in many aspects, and free groups get very large, yeah. very fast. Yeah. That's the problem we have with really implementing it. <coughs> okay, um, and we see. Okay, but we see if our group is not torsion free, then we can't have a final resolution because the homology groups are just factor groups of this resolution, of submodules of this resolution, and um, if these were trivial, our homology groups would be trivial, and we can't have that. So okay, we know that our resolution is not projective. It says here it's not free, it's not even projective. 
And um, so we want to use the technique by Wall, Ellis, and Williams to construct a free resolution. Maybe some of you have read the paper by Wall called Resolutions for Tens of Products of Groups. It's a very nice paper. I yeah, think it's it three or four pages, not very long. But there's an interesting speckled sequence involved. Yes. And um, we're going to use the same arguments here. Uh, this is going to look kind of scary, what's going to come now, but... Uh, what Old-fashioned old stuff. Old-fashioned old stuff, yes. yes. I think it was in the 60s or yes. some, something. <laughs> so, we get these... Well, what do we get? We get these uh, R, Q, Gamma, E. What do I mean by that first? Okay, I uh, remember when, when I go back to the theorem, we want to have three resolutions for all the finite subgroups. And I call these resolutions R, uh, R gamma E, where E is the, stabil stabil is the simplex, gamma E is the stabilizer of. This is a finite subgroup. We said, okay, we want to have uh, resolutions for three resolutions for these, and I call them R gamma E. So that's just what RQ gamma E is. And as you can see, uh, what we get here is um, some kind of twisted tensor product. I mean, um, uh, I'm trying, I, I'm using the induction functor. I'm, I'm uh, working over Z gamma E in R, RQ gamma E. And I want you to work over Z gamma. So I'm using induction to build a Z gamma module out of that one. And I do that for every orbit of synthesis, of finite synthesis. And I just, you know, I just sum them up. I just take the direct sum. There are only finitely many of these orbits, so this is a finite direct sum. These are the three, uh, the three modules I'm going to use. Why are they free? Because RQ was gamma free by definition. Uh, by, yeah, we wanted to have RQ, gamma, uh, RQ free. And if we start with a free group and free module and use induction, we still get a free group. Okay, and of course the direct sum of free, free modules is free too. So, um, what are these these uh, these maps here? I mean, I've got an infinite infinite number of these these modules, and um, actually, these are, is is this letter called eta? I think it's eta. Whatever. I'm going to call it eta for now. <laughs> 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 this eta vertical is going from uh, this with RQ, RQ to RQ minus one. So all, all the rest of the rest of the stuff sit there is the same, but the Q is one less. So this is just uh, this map is just induced by the chain map of RQ, and that also means that uh, taking this map squared means uh, we get zero. So we get a chain chain complex there, at least. The case with uh, eta H is more involved because uh, we've got Z gamma E here. And um, so this gamma e, eta H is, in, is uh, induced by the map chain of, of the chain of the ribs complex. Let me say that again. It's in, induced by the chain map of the ribs complex. And uh, as this uh, gamma E is down here uh, at the tensor product, this doesn't necessarily, necessarily square to zero. So there's another problem there. And um, what Ball showed, showed in his paper was that you can, for tensor products of groups, it's just the same definition, you can build a, you can build a free resolution by summing up all of, these, all of these factors and adding a perturbation. And this perturbation is just the same on all uses, really. Um, in this kind of uh, form, it's, uh, it was first used by Williams and Ellis, I think. Okay, so that's just um, what we're going to take as differential. And it turns out that we, okay, this is the structure of the perturbation maps. It's, it's not really important. It, um, it's just, uh, let me show you here. They just go like this. So. Basically, they only elimin eliminate all the choice we had while defining these eta h maps and making them all equivalent. And you need to have the extreme of choice for the definition of these um, 
these uh, perturbation maps, which is why it's kind of hard to program it into a computer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but still, for the total free case, we don't need all that. <laughs> but um, as long as we believe in the axiom of choice, we can define these, just as Wall did. And uh, what happens next is uh, we get, we've got this, uh, this module R, which is just, um, which is the, just the direct sum of our FRs along these lines. And, okay, we've, we've got direct sums, we've got a filtration on these modules on this chain complex, and thus emerges the spectral sequence, and um, yeah, the spectral sequence tells us that these are, that you can choose these uh, perturbation maps in such a way that this turns out to be a resolution. Okay, and as I already said, it's free because all the vectors are free. Mm. It's finite degenerated because all of these are finite degenerated, so we've got our, the resolution we wanted. And of course, it's of infinite length because um, all of these R Q gamma e are of infinite length. But still, it's a direct, uh, it's, a, it's a direct sum of finitely many finitely generated free modules. So it's still free module that's finitely generated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's an outline of the proof. This was kind of hard to do, really. So we've got some consequences of this theory now. Uh, other questions until until now? Yeah. So now we've got this theorem. Now what, now what do we do with it? This is a very nice uh, result. It's not very hard to do if you've got a delta hyperbolic and virtually torsion free group. Then you can construct the ribs complex, do everything as in the torsion free case. You can't, uh, and you get, with a ribs complex, a, a re free resolution of a subgroup, of every subgroup you want, basically. But as our subgroup is torsion free, the operation is free on the, on the ribs complex of gamma. So for any, you know, any hypothetical um, subgroup of this, we've got that the virtual cohomological dimension, uh, I may, maybe I should define that one, is smaller than the dimension of the ribs complex. But it depends on, on the sigma. Huh? It, it, it depends on the sigma, you know. Sigma? Delta. delta. Uh, the de I'm sorry, delta, yes. It, it, it does depend on delta, so you have to, right. have to find. It also depends on, uh, delta depends on s, so you, you have to be really smart to choose. Can it you get it? Can you get rid of that delta there? I mean, no, not, not, not with this kind of thing, because, all the, uh, because the whole construction of the ribs complex right. okay. is uh, really dependent on delta. So by for CD or virtual cohomological dimension, we mean uh, the length of the smallest right. possible resolution we can find in terms of length of mm -hmm. resolutions. And uh, the funny thing about this corollary is that we don't need to know a torsion free subgroup. So if there is one, we actually know something about its cohomological dimension, which is just kind of nice. And the next thing is. Um, we can calculate all the uh, Euler, Euler, Euler? Mm -hmm. Euler characteristics of the groups if it's torsion free. Now, if it's not torsion free but virtually torsion free, you can go to a torsion free subgroup and do the same thing. But uh, it would be harder to do that, so I'm just going to give you this example. We implemented that one in GAP2. We take uh, this n as small as possible but uh, big enough so that our ribs complex gets contractible. We construct the ribs complex and the dimension thereof, and we calculate the number of orbits of each number of cells, and we just take the usual generic Euler characteristic formula, plug it in, and as we know, it's a free resolution, and we know that um, he from of, of, of C, if C is the chain complex that has, has an Euler characteristic, is the same as uh, the Euler characteristic of uh, the homology, we actually know that um, we get the homology of our, yeah. of, of our group, and so we know that we get the Euler characteristic of our group. So that uh, really is an algorithm for torsion-free groups. We implemented that one too. Um, you see you put it on GAP? It's actually a GAP package now? No, no, it's not a GAP package. It was my first, my first time ever to, uh, to write you know, bigger computer programs than just five lines, so... Uh, oh, I see. Okay. I well, eventually I would expect this to be part of GAP, no? I mean, 
it would be kind of interesting, but uh, I've moved on to infinitely presented groups lately, so um, if well, somebody, if he wants to do it, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't, doesn't Magnus compute uh, homology of, of yeah. the, the program no. It doesn't do it? No. Oh. Okay. I'm almost done, but um, remark, okay. The problem is really uh, things get rather, rather big very, very fast. Mm -hmm. So if we have a generating set and a free subgroup uh, and, a, and a subset of S that generates a free subgroup, you see you've got this kind of uh, formula for the dimension. So it's, it gets very large so quick that uh, that's the reason why we really didn't put much uh, more work into it. it. It just doesn't make much sense because uh, in light of this one. You could do it for finite groups, but you would have to solve the problem to find the perturbation maps then. Mm. And that's a completely different story again. Mm. Yeah, so that's what we did on the homology of hypothetical groups. I think I, yeah, that's the last slide too. So are there any questions? Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. So let me thank you uh, again for the invitation. Yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Very. Mm -hmm. I like this remark. <laughs> okay. About the uh, knowledge of uh, what kind of sub uh, three subjects you can have. Yeah. I don't like that remark because it means it's all very inefficient if you just want to use. <laughs> but she wants to turn it around and say, yeah. she wants to turn around and say, well, if I know this dimension, then I know that there can't be a free subgroup of so yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so. I never considered that one. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. That's, a good, that's a very mm -hmm. good idea. I should write, should write to Rosenberg about that. After you get a kind of tits thing then that way, yeah. right? You get to. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's a uh, test. Yes. yes. Although mm -hmm. not, a, not a very practical Not one, very it's practical. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Theoretical. Yeah. Homology was uh, invented really for alternative ways of finding conditions for certain properties of groups. Yes. And uh, this fits into that uh, philosophy. Yes. Yeah. So. Because at that time, People were very optimistic about the abelian groups. So, but they turned out to be tougher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it's, uh, abelian yeah, groups it's are a very nice category. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. You can do many things in, mm -hmm. in that category. Yeah, but it's a nice thing, actually. I'm going to talk mm -hmm. to Rosenberg about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any more questions or comments? Very nice talk. Yes. Thank you. Uh, actually, it was my second talk in English. The first one was at Las Vegas, Nevada, last few years. <laughs> <laughs> I was oh, very good. well. You know, his mm -hmm. first talk was very good as well. Uh -huh. This one was a bit more complicated. Though. You need to Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you, speaker. Thank you. And we have another talk today as well. I guess we'll start in maybe 10 minutes. Good. Hey, you're killing us. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs>